Guan slowly regained consciousness. He realized that someone was shaking him and cursing at him, but he did not answer. He had no clue who was hitting him, nor did he realize where he was. From afar, he heard a voice asking him, Man, what are you doing here at this time of night? The last bus left here two years ago. Shaking it, urgently called an ambulance. And so the siren wailed. The ambulance arrived in the glow of flashing beacons. He was loaded into the cabin, covered with a blanket that smelled of medicine. That's when the pain came to Duan. He was in incredible pain. His head pounded, throbbing to the beat of his heart. He didn't know what to do about it. He tried to slow his breathing, hoping it would provide at least some relief for a split second. As he dealt with the pain, he tried to realize who was around him, but he couldn't do so as he didn't have the strength to open his eyes. Guan heard sounds. It was a damned humming and whistling in his head that was driving him crazy. Soon the car stopped. He was being carried somewhere. He smelled the distinctive odors of a hospital. He realized that they had stripped him, started taking his blood pressure, giving him some injections. Then there was a gurney on which he was brought into an elevator and taken to the top floor. His hands were bandaged and immobile. Kwan couldn't feel anything, neither his legs nor his arms. He gradually began to fall into some dark abyss. When he awoke from his oblivion, he found himself entangled in a multitude of wires and tubes. The wires were connected to some kind of computer. The computer detected that Duan was awake and sent a signal to the nurse, who immediately appeared in the room, along with the doctor. The doctor smiled welcomingly at him and said, We took your cell phone. It was not blocked. There we found the caller's wife, called her. She arrived at the hospital about two hours after your admission from an inoperable bus stop. Duan slowly tried to remember how he had ended up at the bus stop lightly dressed for this time of year. Why he sat on a bench waiting for a bus that hadn't been there for a long time. At the same time, he had his own car in the yard and his warm jacket lying there. He began to understand the reason for his behavior when his wife burst into the room and began to resent his foolish and unreasonable behavior. It was then that everything fell into place and he remembered what he had witnessed on that fateful day. That day had been an ordinary Friday. Juan was at work. Everything was fine. At 11 o'clock, a transformer blew, and the bosses decided to let the workers go home, as their stay in the workshops was deemed unnecessary. Around 12, Juan put the car in the parking lot and went up to his apartment. While still in the parking lot, he spotted the car of his high school friend, Rojas. They were family friends. Rojas' wife worked at the mall as a sales clerk. Not paying attention to Rojas' car being in the parking lot, which was basically their house, Juan entered the parking lot and went up to his floor. He opened the door with his own key, as he knew his wife was not at home, she must be at work. He went into the hallway, and there he heard a muffled conversation between his wife Valentina and his friend Rojas in the bedroom. Valentina, I don't have much time today. I have a plan to fulfill. I think we can get right down to business, and I'd like to see you more often. Rojas, you disappoint me. I can only see you once a week, Friday, and only once a month. The other days I'm busy. I have a job, too, and I have a daughter to take care of. And for the future, you have to consider that our kids are getting older and smarter. I'm sorry, but in the future, we do have to be careful, and I have a plan to make today. And I'm only here because I know Juan doesn't suit you. Rojas, that's not true. Juan suits me perfectly. I still don't understand how you and I ended up in bed together, and you should be ashamed of yourself for doing this to your best friend, and don't berate him. Maybe you're right, I should be ashamed, but I'm not, and it's because of how I felt about you for a long time. And for you, I'd leave Milagros if you just asked me to. You know I love you, and I want to be there for you, but right now, I only have a weekday. I know you love Juan, but I love you more than him. To what started in the bedroom next, Juan couldn't look or listen. To avoid doing anything stupid, he turned around and left. He didn't take his warm jacket from his car, he slowly wandered toward the highway. He reached a long dormant bus stop. He sat down on a bench. He sat there, not noticing neither cars, nor passers-by, nor the cold. There he stayed until 10 o'clock in the evening, until he was noticed by a patrol of traffic police and called an ambulance. 
And now Juan was just lying on the bed with his eyes closed and not responding to anything. Now that he was back in the land of the living, he needed time to realize everything and make a decision. That was why he had ignored Valentina, even though he realized he couldn't go on like this for much longer. Now the woman who had betrayed him and their wedding vows stood beside him as he lay in his hospital bed and spoke in a raised tone. Tuan, you made me worry. You didn't call and you didn't come home. I don't know what made you almost freeze to death at the bus stop. What's wrong with you? Because Juan was tired of everything. He just turned away and fell asleep almost immediately. He woke up in the night and began to ponder what had gone wrong and why. He had never noticed anything alarming in Valentina's behavior. Valentina, after becoming a mom, stayed at home until she was three. At the same time, she had quite a bit of free time. When Katie went to kindergarten, she did not immediately go to work, and some time was spent shopping or going to the movies with friends. Sometimes they would go out in the evening if they wanted to see some movie at the theater. At the same time, always all holidays were met in the company of Roges and Milagros. Juan fell asleep again. In the morning, the nurse woke him up to give him medicine. He noticed that Valentina was gone. The doctor entered the room and said, I've signed your discharge papers, you can go home, but given that you have light clothing, wait for some transportation. Maybe your wife can take care of it. I don't know where she is. I'm sorry, but I can't keep you. You're not our case. You should see a psychologist. The nurse complimented the doctor who left. My wife left several numbers. I called them, but my calls went unanswered and went straight to voicemail. At that time, the foreman, Arturo, entered the room. He said cheerfully, Tuan, this is where you've been hiding. Arturo, where did you come from? My wife works in the emergency room. She said you were brought in on her shift. So I thought I'd come see you. I'm out of the hospital. I'm wondering how to get home. No problem. I'll drive you. Just let me know when you're coming back to work. I think I'll go to the doctor on Monday. Juan and Arturo talked for about 20 minutes. He told the foreman what happened and how he got to the hospital, to which Arturo replied, What friend you have? I, for one, would have killed him right away. And what, I'd go to jail and my daughter would be an orphan? What are you going to do? I'll think about it, but first, I'll talk to Valentina. The nurse came back, brought the paperwork, said, I'm sorry, but it's a day off, that's why there's a delay. We don't discharge on weekends, you're the exception. Forty minutes later, Juan pulled up to the house. Arturo said goodbye. If you need anything, you know my phone number. Call me anytime. He went up to the fifth floor. Only his daughter was home. That surprised him. He asked, Aren't you at your girlfriend's tonight? No. She went to her grandmother's with her mom for the weekend. She'll be home late tonight. Where's mom? She said she had some errands to run and to see you at the hospital. She'll be here around six o'clock. That's fine. I'll change quickly, and you and I will go to the mall, take a walk, go to a coffee shop. That's great. I'm going to get ready. Soon, they were on their way to the mall. In the evening, around 7 o'clock, they returned home. The daughter was full of impressions. Valentina was home, and from the doorstep, she began to complain. Juan, why didn't you call and tell me you were released from the hospital? I tried to call you at home on your cell phone, but you never answered. All calls went to voicemail. And as far as I know, you never called me back. I'm sorry I missed the calls. I forgot to charge my cell phone and the battery died. And I went to the salon this morning, so I wasn't home. My daughter came up to me and she said, Daddy, look how I did my homework. Sure, I'm coming. They went into the room and there the daughter suddenly asked, Daddy, is everything all right with mom? Daughter, I'm fine. You don't have to worry about anything. Juan checked the homework. He noted how neatly and correctly it was done. Then they watched television. When Katie started to fall asleep, hugging Juan, he carried her to her room and put her to bed. Upon returning, he said to Valentina, I need to get some sleep since I'm going back to work on Monday. Aren't you going to the clinic? Not yet. Tell me, what happened to you? What should I be prepared for? Maybe the doctors prescribed some pills. Nothing. I'll be ready soon, and I'll talk to you. 
I'm sleeping separately tonight because I have a restless sleep, and it's better to sleep alone. In fact, Juan realized that she had cheated. He needed to decide what he wanted and what actions needed to be taken to secure his future and his daughter's future. Valentina's future did not interest him. Guan woke up before dawn. He started his car and drove to work. The work locker room was buzzing with excitement as everyone shared what a good time they had over the weekend. No one knew that Guan was in the hospital. The shop foreman, Arturo, didn't mention it to anyone but asked him. When are you thinking of taking time off? For overtime. The foreman remembers it for now, then he'll forget and you won't get any. I thought there were orders. Tuan, we've been working together for days. You know the annual overtime rate is 120 hours. You're getting close to that. Put in your notice, and I don't want you here for weeks. Tuan thanked Arturo and decided maybe he should see a counselor. But in order to get an appointment, he had to make an appointment. After agreeing on time off, Juan started the car and drove toward home. The phone rang. Looking up, it was his sister calling. He answered. Isabel, I'm listening to you. Juan, is it true that you spent the weekend in the hospital? How do you know? Kitty told me. I was just talking to her. They're having a competition at the gym near here. What happened to you? I'm better now. Don't worry. We just had a power transformer fire at the substation on Friday. The bosses made a goodwill gesture and let everyone go home. When I got back, I found Valentina in bed in the bedroom with my best friend Rogis. They didn't see me, and I didn't bother them. I just left. The tension was so high that I passed out, and the police picked me up. I spent the night in the hospital. From the aftermath, it was just hypothermia. I'm out now, I took some time off, and I'm on my way home. I can't believe Valentina did this. I always thought you two had the perfect marriage. Isabel, so did I. It's been a complete shock to me, and it's made me faint. Now I'm deciding what I'm gonna do and what I'm gonna do, so I'm taking some time off. I'm gonna take care of my personal life. Listen, don't do anything that could hurt you. Like what? See, you don't know. I have a friend named Carmen. She's a divorce lawyer. She's the one who was disliked when she was a kid, the only one of my friends who went to university and got a degree. I'll call her now. Can she take you in? Is she like a minister? You have to make an appointment with her. She's a very popular lawyer in our city, and not only in our city. She's a divorce lawyer. Wait for the call. Juan decided to wait for his sister to call. She called back and said, Carmen's waiting for you at the office. The office is downtown. It's the only one there. I know, I'll be there in 10 minutes. Does she still have the same last name? Yeah, she's not married yet. Juan quickly found Carmen's office and saw her last name on one of the doors. He knocked and heard, come in. Walked into the office. Carmen was sitting at a large desk with some papers spread out on it. She pointed to a chair and said, Sit down and tell me about it. I have a new client in 20 minutes, by appointment. Juan told Christina what had happened. She too remembered his childhood friend Rojas and was surprised at how dishonest he was. She asked, Do you want to keep the family together? Only if it's for Katie's sake. Katie's a big girl. Tell me, can you handle raising her if she stays with you? I think I can handle it. Good. Good. We'll try to keep the family together. I think you should start by talking to your wife directly, without innuendo and honestly but without any outside witnesses. Okay, I'll do it today. Or I'll have to get a divorce, and I can't guarantee you that the court will keep the child for you, although her opinion will be taken into account. Here's my card. It has my phone numbers, and in addition, handwritten phone number, which I answer 24 hours a day. There was also some advice on how to behave. Juan left the office and went home. He decided to talk to Valentina before Kate got back, since she was supposed to be at her girlfriend's house today. He needed more information than he had. All questions could only be answered by Valentina. When Juan arrived home, he noticed that Rogis's car was parked outside his house again. He couldn't believe that Valentina had brought Rogis back to the apartment again after he had just gotten out of the hospital. Guan took his time, sitting in the car and gathering his strength. He was ready to kill Rojas if he caught them again. 
he got out of the car and walked up to his pad. He opened the front door and walked in. In the kitchen, he saw Valentina, who was sobbing, resting her head on Roja's shoulder. It looked like Roja's was just trying to comfort her, Juan asked. Roja's, and what are you doing in my apartment at this time of day? You always said you had to earn money and your car is idle. A confused Roja's bounced off Valentina and replied, Hi Juan, I just came by to see how you were doing. I'm sorry I didn't visit you at the hospital. Valentina intervened. Juan, you're supposed to be at work. Anyway, I was so worried about everything that happened, and Roges came to see how you're doing. I wonder how he knows you're not at work, and he couldn't call me or you and see how I'm doing. Or is his cell phone battery dead, too? No, it just happened. I wasn't watching my cell phone. What if there was a rush order from dispatch? I'm not the only one in the trucking business. One of us would have taken the order. Roges, your concern for Valentina is noteworthy, but don't bother right now, and I'm asking you to leave us alone. We need to talk. Of course we do. I'll go to the parlor. Roges left the kitchen, Juan asked. Valentina, have a seat. Anything that is said must remain between us. This is our marriage and Roges has nothing to do with it. Juan, Roges does not interfere in our marriage, and what makes you think I would involve him in our marital affairs? You involved him a long time ago, when you decided to meet every Friday, behind my back, at our house. Now I see your meeting on Mondays, too. Why would you do that? Who told you these stupid things? Tell me while he's here. Why? I saw it all myself. The day of my accident, I came home because we were off work because of the substation accident. Guess what I saw? Well, that's a rhetorical question. Just witnessing your cynical betrayal was incredibly painful. I imagined what would have happened if your daughter had caught you. It made me leave before I would have killed Rodas. I left, and I don't know why, I came to an abandoned bus stop where I fell into a catatonic state and nearly froze to death as a result. I heard all about your plans to be more careful because the kids are growing up, and that Rodas would like to see you more often because of his great love for you. That's probably why he's here today. What do you say at work on Fridays? Going to meet my lover. Valentina knelt down in front of Juan, cried, and began to cry. I'm so sorry, Juan. Please forgive me. At the sound of sobs, Roges entered. He looked at the sobbing Valentina and asked, Juan, what did you do? He took a step towards Valentina, but Juan stood in front of him and said in a threatening voice, Get out of my house so I don't cause trouble. You are not welcome here. You've been running to my wife behind my back, and I won't stand for it. You're no longer my friend. The fact that she's crying right now doesn't mean anything. It's probably just the realization that she's been caught. I never touched her, and I won't now. And since she's still my wife, if you don't want me to hurt you, get out of my apartment and out of our lives. Valentina, between sobs, said, Roges, leave. We did something stupid, and I, through my behavior, almost killed the man I love and care about. Roges reluctantly turned around and walked away. Juan went to the window and made sure he got into his car and drove away. Then he turned to Valentina. Get yourself cleaned up. As long as we are married, Roges must not enter this house. You must cut off all contact with him. That means you must not call him, text him, meet with him. But if, of course, you want a divorce, then you can go ahead. We'll continue this conversation tomorrow. And what will you decide? That depends on how we talk to you and what you want in your life, and whether you want what I want. Valentina went to take a shower and clean herself up. Juan, taking advantage of her absence, installed a spy program in her phone. Now he knew about all calls to that number and all incoming texts. Moreover, he could listen to and record all conversations. This program had been purchased by him a long time ago to monitor his daughter. He could always connect to her phone and find out where she was, hear all her conversations, read her texts. He didn't need the program to monitor his daughter. He realized now that it was unlikely that Valentina's years-long association with Roges would simply end and he needed control over his wife. Caddy came in. Kwan sat with her in her room and helped her do her homework. Valentina, who had cleaned herself up, prepared dinner.
After dinner, Juan and Caddy watched television, and Valentina, after washing the dishes, went to her bedroom. The next day, Juan slept in and wasn't going anywhere. In the evening, he called Valentina at work and said he would meet her at the end of the day. Valentina did not readily agree. She left the office, approached Juan, who was waiting for her, and asked, Are you trying to control me? No, I just decided that we, as loving parents, should go together and watch the finals of the competition, in which our daughter is also participating. Or do you have other plans tonight? I don't have plans tonight. And what is our daughter competing in? She's playing basketball. At her height. She's got a great shot. They went to the gym. The entrance was free. They sat in the bleachers, and the female athletes were warming up on the court. Katie noticed them in the gym and waved. The game began, which was held with varying success. Katie was on the court all the time, which said that she was a valuable player. The final siren sounded. Katie and the team she played for had won. After the awarding, their daughter happily ran up to them. Juan suggested, Katie, you change, we'll go to a cafe. Sit down, celebrate your victory. Where's your friend, by the way? Why didn't she come to watch the game? Dad, she couldn't make it. She's a swimmer. She's got a competition today. Call her and ask her what her results are. A few minutes later, Katie proudly announced, Dad, Mom, she won first place and Mom was with her at the competition. Dad was working again. They went to a cafe where they had dinner pretending to be a happy couple for their daughter's sake, and if she knew anything, she didn't show it. After dinner, they went home. Before going to bed, Katie hugged and kissed Juan and Valentina, thanked them for a wonderful evening, and went to bed. By 10 p.m., the lights went out in her daughter's room. Juan told Valentina that he wanted to surf the internet and retreated to the room where the computer was. Really, he just needed to get his thoughts together, to be alone, away from her. Valentina said, You promised that you and I would talk things over. Valentina, these have been busy days. Tonight was family night. Come on, let's put our problems aside and focus on enjoying time with our daughter. Tomorrow we can be reasonable and civilized when we talk. We need time to think. We need to realize where we are and where we are going. Okay, Juan, I agree. And once again, I'm very sorry for what happened. I know you're sorry, but we'll discuss it tomorrow. Juan thought a lot about his marriage and his family. He decided to try to negotiate with Valentina, since marriage was a voluntary union of the two, and she had a say in it, but he also thought about all the scenarios and how they would unfold. In any case, he had demands, and if Valentina did not fulfill them or refused to fulfill them, he was ready to divorce. The reason why he made the concessions he did was because of the daughter. He realized after receiving clarification from Carmen that there could be complications in the divorce. Early in the morning, he heard Valentina walk into the kitchen, smell the aroma of freshly brewed coffee. Duan got up too, showered, shaved. He came out rested, woke Caddy, and told her, Cat, you need to get up, eat breakfast, and get ready for school. What should I make you for dinner? Dad, make pancakes with raspberry jam for dinner. Juan went into the kitchen. Valentina was already ready to go to work, Juan suggested. Let's go to the skating rink this weekend as a family. His proposal was supported by Valentina and Caddy, who came into the kitchen. The day passed monotonously. Juan was doing something in the house. After work, Valentina came in. Her daughter had called before and warned her that she would be late at her friend's house. It was time to clear the air with Valentina, for the fate of the family hung in the balance, and he had no idea which way the scales would tip by the weekend. He was willing to fight for his marriage, but Valentina would have to go along with it. One thing he knew for sure, never, under any circumstances, would he agree to Valentina and Rogis dating. After waiting for Valentina to eat dinner, Juan entered the kitchen, sat down at the table across from her, and said, I promise to give you a chance to explain fully what happened in our marriage. You realize how unacceptable this is to me, especially with a man I considered my best friend. I didn't expect him to be so mean. Don't try to make excuses. I'm not considering excuses. I don't want to hear from you that he's a really nice guy or anything that can serve as an excuse. Roges doesn't exist to me. 
So any defense of him will end this discussion and our marriage will be ended. Juan finished his introduction, and after giving Valentina a chance to digest what he had said, he poured himself some tea and continued. If you want to stay married, if you want to keep your family together, I have a few demands that must be met. If you don't agree to them, everything will be terminated, and I will proceed with the divorce. I don't want to end the marriage and break up the family because I love you. You don't have to talk about loving me. If I hadn't caught you on Friday, this would have gone on and on. I don't want to do any more catching and fighting. I expect fidelity from you, as I expect from the spouse to whom I am bound. I have been faithful throughout my marriage and I expect the same from you. Valentina cried and Juan added. Valentina, you don't have to cry. I am simply stating the fact that you have been unfaithful and telling you what I expect of you. This is in case we decide to stay married. Juan paused and said, I want to express everything. So, let's not interrupt. Okay, I'm listening. Whether you agree or not, you betrayed me, our daughter and our family by cheating with Rotus. And what you and my friend did is, to me, the greatest betrayal of all. It was a mutual decision between you and Rogus, and I thought of him as a brother whom I trusted immensely. I thought of you as the loyal wife I loved more than life, but it turns out you both disrespected me. As a result of the affair, I received a shock that was almost fatal. I never imagined that my meetings with Rogus would end so badly, and I don't want you and I to break up. Valentina, because of what you've done, two marriages are on the brink of dissolution and a friendship that lasted almost a lifetime has been flushed down the toilet. So my next demand is that you cut all ties with Rogers forever. What, you want his wife to find out? Why wouldn't I? Especially since he's gonna leave her. That's what he told you. He doesn't care about her. He's coming out of this with the least amount of damage at all. You think he wants you? I doubt it. He likes the excitement. I don't know what Carla will decide about him, but I'm not getting involved. And yes, I've heard him say he wants you to leave me, that he's loved you for a long time and wants you to leave me for him. But I wasn't going to give up on you. And actually, I wonder if either of you thought ahead of time about the impact of divorce or divorces on our families. I respect your parents. It hurts me to think that I might lose the close relationships we've had over the years. The loss of friends and our children. They will be forced to live in a home with one parent with their father or mother. The other parent will be seen on days determined by the court. In other words, family will be sacrificed. Valentina thought about what her husband had said as he drank the cooled tea leisurely. She wondered how he could even think about saving the marriage. If he had cheated on her, she wouldn't forgive him. The thought crossed her mind. She should save her marriage while continuing her meetings with Rodas. She would just have to be more discreet but the most important thing to her right now was saving her marriage. She knew that Rojas, with his erratic earnings, would not be able to support his family properly. So she said, Juan, I'm sorry I hurt you. It was a stupid thing to do. How did it happen? A year ago, when you were sent on a business trip from the factory, Rojas came to see me in the evening. He wanted to borrow the drill you promised him. I'd had too much to drink that day. A girl at work was having a birthday party. Katie wasn't home, she was at a friend's house. That's how it happened. Then we started seeing each other on Fridays, once a month. On those days, I let Katie stay longer after school for basketball practice and at her friend's house. But why did Rogers think you two were in love? I don't know, but our meetings went by quickly and he wanted more. I wanted to end it. It was weighing me down. So why didn't you end it? I'm sorry, it meant nothing to me. Juan, I love only you. I want us to work on our marriage. Please forgive me. I want to make up. When she was done, Juan told her. Valentina, I need time to think things over. I'm going to stay with my sister for a few days. I need to be alone. Juan went to his sister's house. She and her husband lived in a big house, and there was plenty of room for everyone. Juan also had a share in the house, but he adamantly refused to give it up. He told his sister and her husband what had happened. Isabel and Victor were shocked by Valentina's behavior. Juan added to his story, his plans for divorce, and they promised to keep it a secret. Then he called Master Arturo and said, I don't have a week, I have family problems to solve, 
but I can't do it by the end of the week. All right, make up your mind. I'll cover for you. Actually, Juan had deceived Valentina, saying she had a choice and an equal say. But he saw that she was deceiving him by saying that roges meant nothing to her. Juan decided to get revenge on her for her pain and humiliation. Now he was thinking about how to get revenge on Rogas, but no plans were being realized yet. He just had to prepare everything and then execute. And for that, he decided to meet Carmen once more. Juan discreetly visited the house and installed two spy video cameras for covert surveillance in the bedroom. His sister's husband helped him borrow the cameras and recorded several conversations between Valentina and Rogis. It was obvious that they planned to continue their affair as soon as things settled down. Rogis once again professed his love for Valentina. In doing so, he said, Valentina, I will leave my wife any time if you leave Juan. Rogis, we've talked about this before. I loved Juan, and I want to stay married to him. But I can't give up on you. I'm ready to come to you on our Friday. Our Friday is next month. Let's meet tomorrow while your dear is at your sister's. Where am I going to take Katie? We'll meet earlier. Let's say 3 o'clock in the afternoon and we'll be done. Okay, you got it. And don't put your car in our parking lot again. After studying the notes but not taking them as a basis, Carmen prepared the divorce papers. That same day in the morning, Juan visited Milagros at work and told her everything. She was furious, and when she heard Roges and Valentina talking, she asked, Do you have a good lawyer? Yes, I do. I discussed with her that you might want to sue too. Yes, I do. When can you go to the meeting? Uh, right now. I'll just let the girls know I won't be here. Guan picked up his daughter from school, and they had a difficult conversation. He explained to her what was going on. Valentina and Roges didn't stay away from each other. As a result, Juan had a video of their meeting because they had decided that Guan would not be home and he would not know about it. Valentina and Rojas agreed to meet again on Friday while Juan was staying at his sister's house. The court that accepted the application decided to deliver the summonses by courier. She organized the delivery of the summonses and the accompanying statements of claim during the meeting between Rojas and Valentina, which had a bombshell effect. Rojas suddenly had no desire to marry Valentina. He started yelling at her. You realize my wife will take away the car I use to ferry people around, which is all I know how to do. You're no good at ferrying people, either. You should sell vodka. You make more money. Angry Rojas went home, but there was a surprise waiting for him in the form of his wife's brother. Seeing his car parked not far from the driveway, Rojas realized everything and did not go home. He knew what this meeting promised him. Valentina grabbed her phone and started calling Juan, and he answered. Valentina, I'm listening. Juan, you said you needed time to think and decide. And today you're sending me a subpoena and a statement of claim. That's not true, Valentina. I didn't send you a summons or a statement of claim. The court did. But my lawyer sent the statement of claim to the court at my request. Why? Valentina... You're nothing but a con artist with no scruples or morals. Not only did you plan to continue your tawdry affair with my former friend, you couldn't even hold back long enough to try to save your marriage. You met up with him again in our bed, on Wednesday. And today, for all I know, a courier handed him the papers at our apartment. Now I'm not interested in what you want, and all our agreements from earlier are null and void. Juan heard Valentina begin to sob. Pausing, he complimented. You see, you lied not only to me, but also to yourself, which is even more unfortunate. You thought I was a complete fool. You just realized that your roaches was nothing. And now you're suffering the consequences of your choice. I wish you weren't in the apartment. And I want to invite my daughter over for pancakes. On Saturday, Juan arrived at the apartment. Valentina wasn't there. Her daughter was home. He asked, Why aren't you at school? They painted the floor at school with some kind of paint that smells so bad they told us not to come today. Fine, I was planning on having you over for pancakes this afternoon. I'll just put my stuff together and we can go. Where are the pancakes? At Aunt Isabel's, where I live now. Guan quickly packed everything he needed, loaded it into the car, and Katie got in. Guan called Isabel back, asked her to make pancakes. By the time they arrived, they were already on the table, 
next to the raspberry jam. They sat down at the table. In conversation, Juan said to his daughter, Katie, I'm not going to live at home. I filed for divorce for mommy, but remember, I'll always be here for you, and you can always call me or find me here. Dad, I know. Mom told me everything. Juan tried to explain to her the reasons why he had to divorce Valentina. He didn't want their daughter to be angry or disrespectful to her mother. Finally, Caddy reported, Daddy, Mom told me that she doesn't want a divorce. I don't want you to get a divorce either. You can forgive her anything, right? I don't know, daughter, but I'm afraid that's not possible. Mommy said she'd do everything she could to make sure the divorce doesn't happen. It's all a big misunderstanding and that you're putting too much importance on it. She told me that if you leave, I'll never see you again. Katie, I'm sorry, but the problems your mom and I have are very complicated. I'll talk to her when I take you home. I'm sorry, but I don't believe anything will change on my end. Know that this has nothing to do with you. I'll always be there for you. You'll see me often, I just won't be sharing an apartment with you and your mother anymore. All the way home, Katie was silent. Juan was furious that Valentina had involved her daughter in adult matters. When they returned, he walked with Caddy to the apartment. Valentina was home. She looked completely worn out and exhausted. Juan asked the first question. I hope you're alone. Juan, I told you it's over. Besides, Rogus is in the hospital. He was in a car accident last night, speeding into an abandoned bus stop. As a result, he suffered broken ribs, skull damage, and a broken arm. There are other serious consequences of the accident. He may be permanently confined to a wheelchair. And how do you know all this in such detail? Did you visit him in the hospital? Yes, but only because he has no one else. His wife and daughter have given up on him, and he's in a very bad way. Now you'll have to find a replacement. I don't need a replacement. You've decided to keep your colleague to yourself. I can see you're happy, and he's your friend. But that's not the issue. We're not a couple anymore. I brought Katie home. Now I'm asking you why you brought a child into our marital problems. She's too young to understand the dynamics of the situation. But I'll tell you, I'll see you in court. At the first hearing, a reconciliation period was given. Three months later, the case began. Valentina tried to fight, turning Katya against her father. Her lawyer asked to extend the period of reconciliation. But the judge rejected this motion and continued to consider the case. Nor did he accept Juan's argument that Valentina was using Caddy. Caddy, when questioned, said she wanted to live with her mother. In doing so, she accused Juan of breaking up the family. The court had no other choice, and custody of Caddy was awarded to Valentina. The request for divorce was granted. Thirty days later, Juan was a free man. A month later, he received a call from Katie asking him to pick her up for her mother. As it turned out, Valentina went on a bender, sometimes did not spend the night at home. In addition, in a conversation with her friend, Katie realized a lot of things. Katie apologized to her father because she was desperate to save her marriage. In the end, there was another court hearing. Guan took his daughter and refused to collect child support for Katie. He explained his decision by saying that he did not want his daughter to owe Valentina anything. Rojas was left disabled for the rest of his life. Juan never visited him. As he said, Rojas no longer existed for him either. Eventually, Rojas was placed in a residential home. Juan constantly passed by an old abandoned bus stop where he himself once nearly froze to death and Rojas had an accident. It was never torn down. Sometimes he would meet Valentina in town and notice that she had aged a great deal and looked terrible. He felt no pity for her, as she behaved towards him, to say the least, unscrupulous. And now she herself was suffering the consequences of her actions. As for his future life, Juan never married. Rojas's ex-wife Carla blossomed and married. Thank you for watching this video to the end. If you liked it, please like it and subscribe to the channel. See you soon.